and I'm now going to introduce to you uh, Professor uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Professor Burnell is visiting professor of astrophysics at the University of Oxford, and she's a past president of both the Institute of Physics and the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, as many of you will know, in 1967, as a postgraduate student, she discovered the first radio pulsars, which is amongst the most significant scientific developments of the 20th century. And this makes her uniquely qualified to talk about this topic tonight. Uh, all I need to say now is that Cork Astronomy Club is immensely honoured that Professor Burnell has made time amongst the host of high-level commitments in the academic world to talk to our small club. And Professor Burnell, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Let's see if we can get my... Right. Can folks see my screen, a title slide? Yes, we can, yeah. So what I'm going to do first is tell you a bit about radio astronomy in general. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about pulsars, um, then about the subset of pulsars called magnetars, and finally about fast radio bursts. And if I behave myself, I'll be talking for somewhere between 30 and 40 minutes. So, the electromagnetic spectrum embraces all the wavelengths that there are. And in this diagram, you can see a tiny little rainbow in the middle. That's what our eyes can perceive, just that tiny little segment of the whole spectrum. If we could see shorter wavelengths, we'd see ultraviolet light, then X-rays and gamma rays. And if we could see longer wavelengths, we'd see infrared, then millimeter waves and radio waves. And I'm going to be talking this evening about radio astronomy. So we're down the far left hand end of that spectrum. So radio astronomy started in the British Isles uh, following Second World War. Some of the people who had worked in radar during the war took, acquired, borrowed, stole radar receiving equipment. They weren't interested in the transmitters, but they were interested in the receivers and attached them to some strands of wire to see if they could pick up radio signals from space. And they did. That was the beginning of radio astronomy. This picture is of the big dish at Jodrell Bank, uh, which is one of the biggest in the world still. It's also one of the oldest radio telescopes in the world, and it's just been given world heritage status. I think it's rather nice that a radio telescope can have world heritage status. Other countries as well started doing radio astronomy, Australia, USA, the Netherlands, France, Lots of others. In Ireland, uh, Ireland now has its first sizable radio telescope. This is at Burr Castle. It's called LOFAR or ILOFAR. The LOFAR bit is standing for low frequency radio astronomy. And it's actually in two patches. Um, one is the patch of tiles that you see on the left. Uh, under the tiles, there are higher frequency radio uh, antennae. And on the extreme right, there's a whole lot of um, low frequency radio antennae. And this is a, a new development for Ireland. And it is, I believe, now working nicely, to the best of my knowledge. So that's at Burr Castle, if ever you go there. Pulsars, as the chairman has already alluded, were discovered over 50 years ago. They give pulses. So if you look at the left hand of this diagram, you keep seeing a flash. That's because there's a spinning star with actually two beams coming out of it, like lighthouse beams. And when the beam shines in your face, you see a flash. Of course, if the orientation is such that you never have a beam shining in your face, then you just don't know this pulsing star exists. 
we probably only see about 20% of them. The right-hand diagram gives you a bit more information. There's a star in the middle. It's got a radius of about 10 kilometers. It's very small as stars go, but it has a mass heavier than our sun. So it's very compact, very dense. Uh, it's spinning about a vertical axis but its magnetic axis is inclined. And the beam comes out from the magnetic poles where the magnetic field, field lines give that kind of cone shape. It forms a beam. And as I said, if the star is orientated such that the beam sweeps over the earth, then we see the pulses. The physics of these things is quite amazing. If you have a mass like the mass of the sun compressed into a ball that's 10 kilometers radius, you can see that the physics is a bit unusual. So these objects are oh dear, small, very dense, neutron rich stars. Um, because there's so much mass in a small volume, they've got very strong gravity. They've got even stronger electric and magnetic fields and they're spinning rapidly. And we believe that they're formed when a star explodes, a supernova. This is a catastrophic explosion at the end of the life of a massive star. And most of the material of the star gets kicked out into space. The core of what was the star gets compressed and forms one of these densely packed little stars. And the main way to observe them seems to be as these radio pulsars. They're seen in radio, invisible, just, in X-rays and gamma rays. And of the 3,000 or so that we currently know about, um, only 20 of them are in the visible. Rather more are in the X-ray and even more in the gamma ray which is all a little bit surprising. About 10% of those 3,000 are in binaries, mostly twinned with another star, but there's one that is a pulsar-pulsar binary. We have one that is a triple in a triple system, and we have a few with planets. Now, given that these things are formed when a star explodes at the end of its life with a supernova explosion, it's quite surprising that there are any planets still hanging around. Maybe these things have picked up planets later on. We're not sure. We're also not exactly sure how many there are of these things, but probably about 100,000 in the galaxy, although it is still debated. The most famous one is in the Crab Nebula, Messier 1. For a long time, this was a puzzle. It was reckoned to be a supernova remnant. It was seen to explode about a thousand years ago. And it's shining. Um, you ought to be getting fainter and fainter. And it's not. And there was a considerable puzzle about how yeah. this nebula kept shining for the last thousand years and why it was still so bright. We now know that there's a pulsar in the center and the pulsar is energizing, keeping shining this supernova remnant. So that's kind of an overview of pulsars in a little bit more detail. So mass is about one and a half to two times the mass of the sun. So it's a few thousand million, 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 million tons. Easy to take in that kind of number, isn't it? All those millions of millions of millions of millions of tons are in a ball that's about 10 miles across. And so the average density of this star is like the density of the nucleus of the atom. And they appear to be rich in one of the particles that you find in the nucleus of the atom, neutrons, 
uncharged particles. And so these things are also known as neutron stars. It is extremely dense. Um, if you took a thimbleful, a sewing thimbleful of pulsar material, it would weigh the same as the mass of everybody on Earth, the whole population of the Earth. Because you've got so much mass compressed into a tiny volume, the gravity at the surface of these stars is very strong. There are also very strong tidal effects. You may recall that tidal effects are radiants of gravity, how gravity changes with distance. And as you will have already recognized, they are very condensed. So the physics of the stuff inside is extremely unusual and extremely interesting if you're interested in that kind of thing. Now, strong gravity will bend light. And this means that if I'm standing on the surface of one of these stars, not to be recommended, but if I'm standing on the surface of one of these stars, I can see 20 or 30 degrees over the horizon of the star. Without moving, I can see about two thirds of the surface of the star. Also gravity redshifts light. So if there were little green men on these stars, they would look to us like little red men. And gravity also affects clocks. Uh, you may not realize this, but your sat nav um, or anything that gives you your position knows that gravity affects clocks and makes corrections for it. This is part of Einstein's relativity theory. The, the sat-nav is, is, is connecting with a satellite, which is up above the Earth, which is in a lower gravity environment than you are back on Earth with your phone or your sat-nav. And gravity affects the rate at which clocks go. The clocks here on Earth um, go faster than, no, go slower, than the clocks up on the satellite where the gravity is less. This uh, affects timings and positions. And if your sat nav or your whatever didn't know about relativity, it would give you a position that was about 10 kilometers wrong. So the fact that uh, your phone can tell you so exactly where you are means that it knows about general relativity. It's been taught general relativity and it's making the corrections. In the case of one of these pulsars, um, if I went to one of these pulsars with a clock, big clock, you stay here on Earth with a big telescope so you can read my clock, you'll see that my clock is doing one tick every two seconds, not one every second. I've gone to the pulsar, the neutron star, with the clock. I can take my pulse uh, with that clock and it seems perfectly okay. Thank you. That's because the gravity has also slowed my heart and my metabolism exactly the same rate as it slowed the clock I have with me. So gravity affects clocks and your sat nav, your phone knows about Einstein's theory of relativity because it gives you a position that is incredibly accurate. Not only is the gravity very strong, but there's a very strong gradient of gravity. So suppose you're coming into land on one of these stars and you're coming in feet first, because that seems to be the sensible way to land. The gravity on your feet is a lot stronger than the gravity on the upper part of your body. And your body gets pulled long and thin by the difference in gravity between your feet and your head. In fact, it's worse than that. The gravity on your feet is so much stronger than the gravity on the upper part of your body. Your body gets ripped apart and your feet land first and other bits of your body follow in a nasty, bloody mess. 
So don't go visit a pulsar. Actually, although the gravity is incredibly strong, the electric and magnetic forces are even stronger. Uh, you perhaps have a fridge magnet, souvenir from a holiday. Its magnetic field is about one hundredth of a Tesla. The magnetic field of a pulsar is about a hundred million Tesla. And if you spin a magnetic field, and pulsars certainly spin, then you generate a voltage which would be about 100 billion volts per centimeter. So strong though the gravitational forces are, the electromagnetic forces are 100 billion times bigger. And don't take your credit cards when you go visiting because they will be significantly wiped. Once you get a star this massive spinning, it keeps spinning. And it's the devil's own job to make it stop spinning. So these things spin to an accuracy of about one part in 10,000 million million. Or put differently, since the age of the dinosaurs, a typical pulsar has lost about a second. And this means we have some incredibly accurate clocks and we've been using these clocks dotted throughout the galaxy to test Einstein's theories of relativity. So they've been incredibly useful. And I have to say Einstein's theories are checking out very nicely. Thank you. So I'm now going to move to talk about magnetars. These are related to pulsars, though we're not completely sure of the exact family relationship. So magnetars are neutron stars like pulsars. They're also highly magnetized, but not quite so spectacularly. And they spin rather more slowly, typically, than pulsars. A pulsar would be spinning about once a second or faster. These are spinning about once every 10 seconds. And they're not as steady as pulsars. They can rapidly speed up or rapidly slow down. But we believe that they are also formed in the same way in the explosion of a massive star at the end of its life, what's called a supernova explosion. So magnetars are formed in about 10% of the occasions and the other 90% would be pulsars. The interesting thing, assuming this, that we're right in this, is that they've quite a short lifetime, only about 10,000 years, which means there's a lot of dead magnetars in the galaxy, probably about 30 million dead magnetars in the galaxy. They have something a bit like earthquakes, which we call starquakes. And these star quakes produce X-ray flares and gamma ray flares, quite short ones, about a tenth of a second, probably because the magnetic field drops quite suddenly. And the amount of energy that comes out in one of these flares is like what you'd get if you put a uh, hundred thousand years of, of sunlight together. So there's quite a lot of oomph. And this number's probably out of date. It says a few dozen are known. I suspect it's probably crept up, but it's, it's not huge. So I'm now going to switch topics, although I'll pick up with pulsars and, and take us off from there. You've, I'm sure, all seen rainbows. Ireland's rather good for rainbows. Um, or if you haven't seen a rainbow, maybe you've seen light going through a prism and producing an artificial little rainbow. And these rainbows occur because the light of different colours, different frequencies, travels at different speeds through a raindrop or through the glass prism. And so the colours get spread out. Something similar happens with radio waves. 
I'm going to play you an audio file. It's got a lot of crackle in it, a lot of static, but in amongst it, there is a descending whistle. Let's see if this works. Did you hear the whistle? Yes. Yeah, yes. That's called a whistler. Uh, these whistling signals were found by radio amateurs sitting there in their back shed with their headphones on, listening to the funny kind of squeaks and pips that come from the Earth's magnetic field and electric fields. And occasionally there'd be this fantastic whistle. It turns out that these whistles are produced when there is a lightning stroke on the far side of the Earth. The lightning stroke generates a radio wave and that radio wave travels around in a big loop following the Earth's magnetic field till it comes down here in Europe. And as it travels around that big loop, it passes a number of electrons. And those electrons hold back the low frequencies and let the higher frequencies go through better. And so the higher frequencies arrive first and the lower frequencies later, even though at the beginning they were all produced together. And so you get this whistle that starts with the high frequencies, which were held up the least, and goes down and down and down and down and down to the lower frequencies, which were held up the most. And they've managed to work out that this is the result of a lightning stroke on the other side of the Earth and that that radio signal travels right round. Now, in this picture, you can see, which is a plot of frequency going up the way, frequency against time. You can see this nice curved signal, high frequency coming down and down and down and down and down. But there's a couple of other things like that and that. And these, all the frequencies arrive together, same instant. So those signals have not been passed many electrons. In fact, those signals have come no distance at all. Those signals are local. So anything, where's my cursor gone? Anything like this is local on these kinds of plots. Anything like this has come some distance. And if you know how many electrons are kicking around, you can estimate what distance they've come from. Now, pulsar astronomers, people studying pulsars, are looking for short pulses. And there's one, and here's another from a different pulsar. And the snag is that if you've got local radio interference, maybe you've got a sparking thermostat next door. Maybe somebody's using an arc, uh, an arc welder. Um, maybe there's a pirate radio station. If there's something local, it can produce a pulse like this as well. And the astronomers who are studying pulsars want to be sure that their pulse or pulses have come from outer space and not from next door. And so they make one of these plots of frequency against time. And if they get one of these nice curved signals like that or that, they say, aha, it's like one of these. It's come some distance. If it was local interference, it would look vertical. So the fact that the pulse shows this curve down shows that it is not local. So when radio astronomers well, radio astronomers regularly check this. When one day they found a pulse like, where's the cursor? Where's the cursor? I've lost it. Here we go. Um, when they find a pulse like this, they say, that's a nice pulse from a pulsar. It's not local interference, is it? And they say, no, because here's the curve down. 
but you can also use this curve down to get a measure of how far away the thing is. Because if it's fairly local, it comes down quite steeply, still curved, but comes down quite steeply. If it's from very, very far away, it comes down quite gently because it's gone past a lot of electrons. Sorry, I'm having trouble controlling my slides. Turns out that this is a beautiful pulse. It is from a distance, but actually it's from one hell of a distance because this is coming down very, very, very slowly. So is it right at the far edge of the galaxy? No, it's not because there aren't enough electrons in the galaxy. This thing is coming from way, way beyond our galaxy. Now, the people who found this pulse never found another one from the same spot in the sky. So they had a real dilemma. What do we do? How do we publish this? We've only got one spiky pulse from apparently way beyond the galaxy. And for a long time, they debated what they would do about it. They eventually published it, and people weren't quite sure they believed it. And then we started finding some more. Again, nice, well, reasonably clean, sharp pulses, and always with a hell of a lot of electrons between us and it. So way, way beyond our galaxy. They're extra galactic. There was often never another pulse like it from that bit of the sky, and nor was there any steady signal. There didn't seem to be any optical, there didn't seem to be any infrared, there didn't seem to be any x-rays. Um, although now they've started being able to position these things, um, and I'll show you about that in a moment. These things are called fast radio bursts because they're very short, sharp, bursts of radio emission. We're finding more and more. Here show plots of a few more, not quite as clean as the first one I showed you, but they are called fast radio bursts and you may not be able to read it, but the notation, the labeling says FRB for fast radio bursts. The top one is 110220, which is 2011, February the 02 and the 20th. So astronomy labeling of dates, indeed scientific labeling of dates, gives the year first, then the month, and then the day. So we've now seen over 3,000 of these bursts, and they are all well outside the galaxy, redshifts of 0.5 to 1, which are quite significant distances. Some of them repeat. There was some confusion caused by the Australians from the Parkes Radio Telescope, which in addition to these kinds of bursts, was also seeing slightly different kind of bursts that nobody else could see. And they occurred, you know, from all over the sky at any, um, you know, any date. And they could not make sense of these until a graduate student made a plot of when these pulses occurred against local time, the time we have on our watches. And they found there was a peak in these bursts between 12 noon and 1 p.m. What do people do between 12 noon and 1 p.m.? They have lunch. There's a staff room, staff canteen at the observatory. It has or had a microwave oven in it. And they had been very careful. They had tested the microwave oven that it was perfectly shielded and that it didn't give, didn't leak any microwaves because you don't want leaky microwaves where there are very sensitive radio telescopes. But what they hadn't reckoned on was that people who were heating up their lunch in the microwave might stop the microwave by opening the door, not by pressing the stop button. Folk 
if you stop your microwave by opening the door, there is a short burst of microwaves before it shuts off that hits you in the chest. I suggest you use the stop button when you want to stop your microwave. So having sorted out that it was microwave leaking out when people opened the door of the microwave, it was just a second or two before it shut down. Um, and for those of you who are into microwaves, you may know that they have swept frequency from high to low. So this is mimicking the dispersion of the radio burst. So having eliminated these microwaves and the Australians then be clear about what they were looking at, we started to address the issue of what are these bursting sources. And to be absolutely honest, we are making slow progress in identifying what these things are. Many radio telescopes are now picking them up. Uh, we're seeing a lot of them, some repeat, but they are all at large distances. ASCAP, which is the Australian Square Kilometer Array prototype, um, it's a, a telescope with lots of dishes, and they operated it with each of the dishes looking in different directions to try and catch one of these bursts. And they caught half a dozen and were able to position them. And this uh, not doesn't reproduce very well, but this diagram shows their positioning of half a dozen of these fast radial bursts. The greeny, bluey, yellow splodge is a galaxy, a galaxy that gives radio waves. And the bright red X marks the center of the galaxy. They are all massive galaxies, particularly big ones. And then there's a white circle or a white ellipse. You can see one there, one there. Hard to see on this one. This one's there. On this one, it's a ring like that. And I can't see where it is on that one. But the burst comes from somewhere within the circle. So some information, but these are particularly massive galaxies. So they've got a lot of stars, a lot of potential candidates, and the positions aren't really yet very good. So we still don't know for sure what makes these bursts or where they come from. But opinion is growing that it's something to do with the magnetars that I was talking about. Something to do with a flare on a magnetar or flares. Um, new radio telescopes are getting in the act. Canada has a new radio telescope called CHIME. It's uh, in British Columbia in amongst the Rockies, quite well screened. Um, and it's picking up lots. It's picked up over 3,000 of these fast radio bursts. Although what it was built to do was to study hydrogen in the early universe. It works at lower frequencies than the other radio telescopes that are seeing bursts. So it gives us a bit of information on the spectrum, but not a lot. And what they've now done is they've put some very simple dishes over on the east coast of Canada. And those simple dishes are also looking at the same part of the sky. And when Chime sees something, it says to those radio dishes, did you see anything? And gets back a yes or a no answer from those other little outrigger dishes, which is helping us position them a bit, but we've still quite some way to go. So there's lots of interesting things going on in astronomy these days particularly in the radio astronomy area with pulsars, magnetars, and fast radio bursts. So lots of fun we're all having. And thank you for your interest and your attention. Thank you. Jocelyn, thank you very much. Thank you. That was... Um... That was absolutely fascinating. And to hear it from your lips is what made it even more fascinating. Right, so uh, 
Linda and Declan, have you been monitoring the um, uh, the questions? Uh, who's going to ask the first one? Okay. Um, I, Ted had a question, I think. Okay, I can do it via, uh, via microphone. Yes, yes, uh, carry on, Ted, yeah. Uh, thanks at first for this uh, incredible talk. I, it's the second time I have the joy to listen to it. First was in UCC, and I enjoy it all the time. Uh, but to the question, you said the redshift of that pulsar is so high, uh, it comes from far, far away. How can you say a redshift is that or that, not uh, if you don't know what the frequency at the source is? Or do you know the frequency at the source? The source seems to be broadband. It's not a single frequency. And because it's broadband, we're able to get that curving whistle and how steeply that curve comes down or how shallowly that curve comes down gives us an estimate of the distance. If it's nearby, it comes down steeply. If it's far, far away, it comes down in a shallow curve. Okay, then you uh, estimate the redshift, not by, uh, like we do in, 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 a, in a spectrum lines, but by the curvature, the steepness of, this, of the curve. Yep, that's right. Okay, thanks. Question answered. Okay, Steve, Steve O'Flynn. There's the next question, Steve. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I just typed it up there. Hi, hi, Linda. Hi, Justin. Hi. Thanks, thanks for the talk. It's very interesting. I just have a, a strange question there. And one of your earlier slides showed the um, rotation of spin and the magnetic axis being different. Mm -hmm. But does the, the physics of supernova allow them ever to line up? And if it lines up, then you don't have a pulsar, do you? But you have a beam coming out of the poles or coming out of the... Um, the, the, the axis of the spin, so it, it, it doesn't pulse, it just continually just sits there with a beam coming out, or is that possible? That's right, you're exactly right. If the magnetic axis and the spin axis were in the same direction, we mm -hmm. wouldn't see pulsations, we'd just see something steady. And has that ever been found? Or, you know, is, is there a beam up there somewhere just pointing at us? Or, you know, maybe there is one and we'll never see it because it's pointing somewhere else. The majority certainly would be pointing other directions because the beam okay. is narrow. Yeah. So the chances of having one pointing straight at us is pretty small. Mm -hmm. And I think we would find it hard to recognize it as a pulsar or a neutron star. Yeah. It look like any other old radio object mm -hmm. radio in the sky. Okay. All right. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. Okay. Um, Aiden. Hey, guys. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, I, I was just wondering, you, one of the one of the earlier bits that you mentioned about the, I think you said the Crab Nebula, that people were wondering how it stayed so bright and that it was discovered that this was due to a pulsar in its center. Yeah. And I suppose I was just wondering what was going on there. Is that just the energy from the pulsar is, is affecting the gases in the nebula or, or what's going, what's happening? Um, some of the pulsar beam gets trapped in the nebula some of the energy from the pulsar beam gets trapped in the nebula. It basically keeps the nebula shining, keeps it jizzed up, if you like. Lovely, I'll have to look out for that. Thank you. Okay, James, James B. Have you got a question? Um, yeah, I just had a question about the voltage and the change of magnetic field on the pulsars. You were saying that uh, there was a voltage on the actual pulsars, and I would assume that's created because of Faraday's law with the constant change of magnetic fields, the voltage is being built up. In that case, would Lenz's law apply where the, the current and the voltage created opposes the change that created it, so the pulsar would start spinning down? Or does that not apply because there's nothing to pass the current through? Uh, the pulsar mm -hmm. does spin down, though I'm not sure it's Lenz's law. Um, the pulsar spins down basically because it's radiating energy. It's you know sending energy out in the radio waves. 
So energy is getting taken away from the pulsar and the only source, well, the, the easiest source of energy is the spin energy. So we reckon that's why the, the pulsar slows down. Um, because the electric and magnetic fields are so very, very strong, conventional electromagnetism doesn't apply in these things, but certainly considerations about the energy does. So I think what I've just told you is correct. Okay, um, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Easterway. Hello, uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, and uh, uh, pulsars, uh, gravitational fields, a result of mass, of course. But what is what's happening to create electric and magnetic fields you spoke about? And my supplementary is, if I may ask, is what's the process that creates the slowing down by electrons of, uh, of pulses? The original star that exploded to give the pulsar or neutron star must have had a magnetic field. And as the core oh. of the star got compressed, the magnetic field got compressed and became a strong or stronger magnetic field. Mm -hmm. You spin a magnetic field, you get an electric field. Right, yeah, yeah. That's the origin of those. I, I wasn't quite sure about the very last bit of your question. You mentioned on radio pulses that the, the uh, gradient of the frequency uh, against uh, what? Um, uh, was shallow, demonstrating how far away these pulses were coming from. But what is the process that slows down uh, different frequencies uh, just by passing close to or through electrons? What is that process? It's called dispersion. Ah. Interaction of the charge of the electron with the electromagnetic wave. Right. And the more electrons you have, the more it slows down. There we are. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Sue? Sue Alwyn? Um, yes. they, the very short lifespan of magnetars. What's the thinking on why they have such a short lifespan? It's not because they're shooting out these fast radio bursts the whole time and just destroying themselves, is it? Um, I think the honest answer is we don't know. Uh. <laughs> magnetars have got so many things going on um, that it's hard to simplify the physics and make it tractable. <laughs> uh, uh. They are, they are defeating us in many ways at the moment. So ah. I don't know that I can actually answer your question more than that. Thank you for trying. Thank you. Okay, Peter, you'll be allowed. Jocelyn, shall I tell you what fascinated me more than anything else? And you may think this is odd, but it was this thing about the lightning strikes on the other side of the earth and the the radio data coming through coming through the earth uh, is interfered with at different rates causing what co co causing that declining whistle have I got that right yes that's right yes um, I found that absolutely fascinating but I'm now so fascinated about that that I actually failed to gather what the significance of that is, because you were using that as an illustration of some other uh, cosmic events. But, but I, 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 I was so stuck on the lightning strikes on the other side of the Earth that I, I forgot to follow exactly why they are so important. Yeah. The, the way the lightning strike signal gets dispersed with the high frequencies coming first, giving you that whistle, that descending whistle. Um, that's due to electrons on the path interfering with the radio signal. Similarly, for these flashes or pulses from these very distant, whatever they are, that flash, that pulse gets uh, spread out by the electrons that it comes past on intergalactic space and through our galaxy. So it's the same physics as the the lightning strike stuff, those whistlers, but it's on a cosmic scale rather than a terrestrial scale. 
so it, it's it's just space itself which is which is slowing down some of the uh, the, 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 the the lower frequency waves. It's electrons in space. Yeah. Particularly electrons in their galaxy and our galaxy. There aren't too many in the space between the galaxies. But it's electrons that um, slow different frequencies, different amounts, and give that whistle. And are these just stray electrons? Yes, basically, they're... Bu bu buzzing around in space? Yeah, yeah. One per cubic metre or something like that? Um, I can't remember what the density is. Um, no, I, I can't, I don't have a figure, I'm afraid, for that. But yes, it's what we call free electrons. Right. They're not attached to any positive charge. There probably are positive charges around as well, but they're unattached. You know, they're bachelor electrons. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. There's one from somebody, I don't know what the name is. Any idea how a pulsar forms? Yes, we have some idea how a pulsar forms. Um, big stars, stars about 10 times the mass of the sun, will explode at the end of their lives. And in that explosion, the, the core of the star can be kicked against and forced down very small, collapsed, shrunk. So we think that's how these pulsars and magnetars are formed. They were the core of the star that did this massive supernova explosion. And in the explosion got highly compressed. Um, well, there was a question from John Burgess. John Burgess, yeah, that's just after popping up. John, are you there? Hi, thank you, Jocelyn. Excellent lecture. Now, I was just wondering, because you were saying that pulses are extremely irregular and don't really decay with time, if you have pulsars of the same size, of the same pulse, in different locations of the sky, and they're coming from very, very far remote regions of the universe. Can they tell us anything about what people are saying, what the dark matter is like 80% of the universe? The pulsars that we observe are all within our own galaxy, except for um, some in the large Magellanic cloud, I think it is. But on a cosmic scale, the pulsars are relatively nearby. The fast radio bursts, these single shot things in contrast, actually are coming from sizable distances. Um, and we're beginning to get a handle, get, get consistency of the story on that, now that we are able to see which galaxies some of them are coming from. I don't know if that answers your question. No, thank you. That's that's fine. I missed that. That the pulsars you're observing are in the Milky Way. So far. Yeah. Um, JW, the question was how a binary pulsar forms. You probably know that many stars are twinned or in even bigger uh, groups, but there's a lot of binary stars. Our sun is unusual in that it doesn't seem to have a partner. It's not in a binary. The majority of stars are in binaries. Now, if one of that pair of binaries uh, runs through its life cycle quickly and explodes as a supernova, then you can get a pulsar formed after that. The snag is the explosion often disrupts the binary. So we find more pulsars single than you might expect. And we think it is because the explosion has broken up the binary sent the companion star on its way. But yep, sometimes they hold together and then we have a pulsar in a binary orbiting another star. Right, um, Declan Carey. Um, thanks very much for a great talk, Jocelyn, it was brilliant. Um, I, I wonder, have we ever observed any fast radio bursts that we think were affected by gravitational lensing? That's a I'm not sure that we could tell, to be honest. Um, 
And I'm not quite sure how much the bending the gravity, how much the gravitational lensing would shift the position. Because we do now know that about half a dozen are connected or in massive galaxies. Hmm. Don't really know the answer to that, I'm guessing. <laughs> okay, great. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, there's one more from Ted. Yeah, thank you. Um, we know that, um, as you mentioned before, the pulsars are solitary or <clears throat> in binaries. And from time to time, we know it from white dwarfs and, and giants. The heavier one steals material from uh, its sibling. Mm -hmm. In this case, the pulsar would steal material from the regular star. And as I have learned, they spin up. They, the frequency of their pulses get higher. Mm -hmm. Do we observe that? And if yes, how many of these uh, getting faster stars do we have out there? Yes, we have observed some stars that spin up. They do it quite suddenly, and we call it a glitch. Um, they're not always in binaries. Uh, the Vela pulsar uh, manages to glitch every so often on its own. So it's not clear to us that it is this accretion that you're referring to that's causing those speed ups. Um, what is causing those glitches is, is another intriguing issue. But yes, you are right that if it accretes material and if the material lands, so to speak, on the right side of the pulsar, then it will spin up. If it landed on the wrong side, it could probably slow it down. But we do suspect there has been there have been spin ups. Um, they're steady spin ups, gradual spin ups rather than the hiccups that the glitches are. Does that answer what you're asking? Yes, thank you. Good, thank you. Okay, I think that's the end of the questions. All right, Peter. Jocelyn, I was wondering if you have any reflections on the overall importance of all these radio phenomena for our, for really for the, for the nature of reality and the universe. I mean, I'm thinking that before 1945, would I be right in saying that no one suspected that these things existed? Or that or I suppose they did suspect them because otherwise they wouldn't have bothered pointing the dishes at the sky in the first place. Why did they suspect they existed? Was it because of uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. And now that we know that they're there, what, 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 what's the importance of them? What do they tell us about the universe and reality? During the war, so the story goes, Japanese radar operators had problems with something that was jamming their radars. This something was low in the east in the morning high in the south in the middle of the day and low in the west in the evenings. And they couldn't work out which country was jamming their radar. It was radio emission from the sun. So it was known by the end of the Second World War that the sun at least gave radio signals. And they thought, well, the sun's a fairly typical star. If the sun does it, maybe other stars do as well. But of course, they'll be much fainter because they're much further away. And that's what early radio astronomy was set up to do, to pick up radio signals from radio stars. And in fact, they hit upon things like quasars, radio galaxies, which are much more common than radio stars or much more detectable than radio stars. And radio astronomy went on from there. And what, what would the, I mean, does this only seem mysterious to us because we can't see radio? Mm. If, 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 we could, if we had sort of radio, de radio detectors in our eyes, well, would, would, would this be any more mysterious than than the fact that you can, that, that stars have visible light as well. No, I don't think we would be at all puzzled by it, but actually having radio eyes is 
quite a problem because our eyes would need to be, each eye would need to be several meters across. <laughs> and we would have big heads. <laughs> right, well, I, I think probably the time has come now for us to uh, be um, thanking our guests and bringing this meeting to a close. Can, can, can I say that um, uh, we feel immensely privileged that uh, one of the world's foremost physicists should have taken time out of your day to talk to our small club. Uh, we are extremely grateful and I'm sure it's an evening that many of us will remember for many years to come. Um, I'd like at this stage to be able to be standing in the lecture theatre at UCC and handing you over a small gift. But of course, if I was in a lecture at UCC, you probably wouldn't be there with me. So this is one of the benefits, I suppose, if you're looking for the benefits, any benefits from the current health crisis which is affecting the world, I suppose this is one of them. But we can uh, uh, speak to a leading physicist from, uh, from Oxford when we're sitting here in court. So, Jocelyn, uh, heart, heart, heartfelt thanks from all of us in Cork Astronomy Club. Uh, and we, we all wish you well in your continuing endeavors to unlock the um, secrets of the universe. And now, of course, I should be asking the audience to clap you, but you said they can't clap either. So, <laughs> so that's a pity. But Jocelyn, thank you very much indeed. Um, we, 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 we feel ex extremely privileged and honoured, and we're, we're very grateful to you for your time. Thank you indeed, and thank you all for some brilliant questions too. All the best. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Jocelyn. Thanks.